Hi everyone, my name's Jen. I'm just, we're waiting for some more people to sign on and I thought I would talk a little bit. Um, welcome to our first webinar class. We're super excited for this whole virtual series. We've got a lot of really awesome classes coming up and um, really excited to see the interest and the enthusiasm. So thank you for joining us today. I just wanted to go over a couple of sort of housekeeping things. Um, first of all, we we do have a poll going on right now. Um, if you can take a moment and fill out the poll and then there will be a follow-up survey um, after the class. And if you can also fill out that too, the more we're trying to get as much information as possible in order to have the classes be as effective as possible for you. So any time that you can do for that would be great. Um, and then wanted to let you know that we will take moments throughout the class today for um, questions. And feel free to um, put your questions in the Q&A portion and then we'll go through as many as possible. And then Suzanne will reserve a period also at the end of the class to sort of do uh, additional questions. Um, if we don't get to your question, we're available if you wanna email us directly um, and to be sure to help answer it. Also, you can um, raise your little hand um, if you wanted to ask something immediate and we can also try to um, do that as well. We will have a 10% coupon for attending and the coupon will be sent out uh, in 24 hours in the follow-up email. So look for that. Um, all right, so I'm super excited to have Suzanne with us today on our first class. She's taught so many classes for us at Slow in person, and I'm so happy that she's able to do this virtually. Um, thank you for joining us, and take it away, Suzanne. Thanks, Jen. I am so happy to be here. I'm very excited. Um, I do want to start off by sharing that there is a question I was able to uh, look at while you were talking, and it says that um, this person is not able to submit the poll. So um, I'd like to just confirm if anyone else is having a problem, not um, that their um, the button is not enabled. Can you just um, note that in the Q and A? we will wanna know if that was just a single blurb or if everybody is having a problem. So, uh, okay, it seems to be working for other people. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So hopefully, Zoe, that uh, there was just a little blurb on your end. And then we really appreciate you taking the time and making the effort to, um, do the poll. Yes, the polls are very happy, uh, very important for us. Anyway, okay, without further ado, let's get started. Jen, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Suzanne Bontempo. Uh, I am the program manager for Our Water, Our World, which is a program that is very familiar for those uh, that live around the greater San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also a professional um, IPM educator, that's integrated pest management, as well as a garden educator and have worked in the garden industry for over 20 years. So we are gonna learn a lot today. So let's get started. All right, so I'd just like to welcome everyone and I'd like to just put it out there that um, there are no gardening mistakes, only experiments. So I'd like to hold this for all of us with the intention that we all come together as gardeners um, new, um, experienced, anywhere in between. And it is always uh, a, an opportunity to, to learn more, to try new things and, um, you know, learn for, from when things didn't really go exactly the way as we anticipated. I like to say that there's never ever mistakes, only, um, I don't know, learning opportunities. So in today's program, 
We're going to go through slides for about an hour. There's a lot of content today. We're going to learn a lot. I hope everyone got their outline. I um, prepared that just so it'd be a little easier for all of us to follow and take notes if we'd like to. I do know that this program is being recorded and Jen will have it posted on the SLOAT website at some point. So stay tuned for that information. But we will also allow time for questions. I'm going to pause through uh, a number of sections of my program just to be able to answer a couple questions. I know a few of you have already sent some questions in that I've prepared answers for. And then we'll have a lot of time at the end to go uh, through more questions uh, after the end of the content part. Uh, what we're going to learn today are best practices and techniques for protecting the soil, for planting, for winter irrigation, for winter garden maintenance, and for pest prevention. So before I dive into the juicy part of the program, I just want to, you know, touch base with everyone and introduce the Our Water, Our World program for those of you that are not familiar with it. For those of us that live in the uh, Bay Area and have certainly shopped at a sloat, we uh, most likely have seen the presence of Our Water, Our World by the literature rack that's always in the pesticide aisle of local garden centers and hardware stores, as well as the little shelf talkers that uh, help identify what is a less toxic product. This is a program that has won national awards. It's an IPM educational program for the public, and it is in partnership with uh, local water pollution prevention agencies, partnering with retail businesses to help bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and to offer you the best pest solutions and pest management for your pest problems that are always going to be less toxic and sustainable. So let's talk about what is IPM. I've mentioned it a couple of times already. IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And what Integrated Pest Management is, it's, it's a decision-making process. It allows us to look at the system as a whole. And in this case, it could be your home or your garden. Today, we're specifically going to be talking about gardens. And it helps us identify when we have a problem we have to identify what that problem really is. Oftentimes what our garden shows us are symptoms of problems. And it could take a while to really kind of hone in and identify what that problem really is. Once we identify what that problem is, we ask ourselves, is this something that we can live with? Is this something that we know is just going to be a, a very uh, small impact or is it something we're gonna to have to take some action? If we take action, what is that action? What does that look like? In integrated pest management, we use a combination of actions. Those actions are going to be cultural controls. That's bolstering the health of the environment. Mechanical controls, the types of tools that we use to manage the pests. Biological controls, working with living organisms to manage pests. That could be beneficial insects like ladybugs or biopesticides like beneficial bacteria such as Bt or chemical controls. These are going to be the pesticides. And we're always going to use these as a last resort and we're always going to use these uh, the least toxic possible. We can also give ourselves the permission to remove the plant. So this one's a tough one because we all become so sentimental and protective of our plants. And if we feel if a plant is failing, we take it personally almost, it's kind of funny. But if a plant just has been struggling and it's never really done well, and we've never really been happy with its performance, give yourself permission just to remove it and put something back in its place that would do much better. Another way of looking at IPM is with this illustration, which I like very much, we're going to identify and monitor for pest problems. We're going to evaluate if that pest problem is a, actually a problem or if it's just a handful of aphids hanging out on the rose bush and we know beneficial insects are going to come in and take care of it. So evaluate. We're going to use preventative means around the garden to prevent significant pest outbreaks. We're going to take action when needed. And then we're gonna monitor and see if that action actually resolved the problem. And then we're going to take notes and see how we can improve upon the situation for the next time. For me, prevention is the key. So we're gonna dive into prevention. We're gonna look like 
we're going to look at what prevention might look like to you. We might look at what tools we can use that can be implemented for pest prevention. We're going to look at timing of management action. We're going to look at correct watering and proper fertilizing to prevent pest problems. We're going to look at sanitation and cleaning up the garden to prevent pest problems. And we're going to look at applying dormant season pesticides to prevent insects and diseases for this upcoming spring. So pest identification is essential. This is really the tricky part. If we can't identify the pest, and I'm going to remind us that a pest can be an insect, a disease, or a plant, if we can't properly identify that pest, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. So it's really important to identify the pest. And then it's important to have an idea of what the life cycle of that pest is and learn about the pest habitat and the timing. For me, a good example is going to be, you know, in late March-ish when the spittle bugs show up, it's crazy. It looks like someone spit on your plants. Well, I know that the spittle bugs come the same time every year they really only last a couple of weeks. They're not doing any significant damage or harm. And I know that I can just kind of blast them off with water and that takes care of it. So that is just a nice example of understanding life cycle and learning about pest habitat and timing. The other thing I would like to point out is that we wanna identify if there's any natural enemies uh, around that can manage that pest. Are they present? So back to the example of aphids on my roses, do I see ladybug larva or do I see surfed fly larva hanging out? Uh, Cause if I do, I know that they're going to take care of those uh, aphids on my rose buds. Understanding that 90% of the bugs that we actually see in the garden are really the beneficial ones. So here is a little question I have for you. You see this on the leaves of your fruit trees in the spring. What is it? What do you do? Hold on. So this one is actually aphid damage. So the leaves look very similar, but the puckering from the on the leaves of this tree is from aphids. Aphids will suck the juices out of the leaves and cause puckering on tender new fruit tree leaves. Whereas this blistering is going to be peach leaf curl, which is a fungus. So two very different pests. And when we, so we'd want to use an insecticide such as insecticidal soap to manage the aphids. Whereas the peach leaf curl, we'd want to use a fungicide. And if we used a fungicide on the insects, that won't really work. And if we use an insecticide on the fungal problem, that won't really work. So that's why proper pest ID is so important. And I'd like you just to remember these two pest problems because we're gonna talk about them again in just a minute. So some resources that are gonna help you out are going to be the Our Water, Our World website where there's a catalog of fact sheets that address certain pest topics, such as ants, aphids, uh, weeds, so forth. And you can reference those. There's also going to be a huge catalog of eco-friendly products that are registered for use in the state of California. The UCI PM website is going to be your go-to for all of us that live here in California. And the reason why I like to point this out is because here in California, we live in a Mediterranean climate. And the way we manage pest problems is gonna be slightly different than how we would manage the very same pests in other parts of the United States where they get summer rains. Easy way to use this website, when we go to UCIPM, in the search bar, I'll just type in peach tree, for instance. And all the diseases, all the pest problems that peach trees get will come up on the side. And then I can go through and identify, is it really aphids or is it really peach leaf curl or is it something else? So I just like to invite you to check out these websites. They're going to be really helpful for you when we are going through pest uh, management and identification. 
So did you know that when you increase the health of your garden, you're reducing pest problems? It's that simple. Healthy soil means less pest problems. Why? Because we're increasing the health of our plant. And how we do this over the winter months is that every time we plant a plant, we want to amend the soil with compost. And through the dormant season or the winter, winter months, it's really nice to do a nice layer of compost on top of the soil under your mulch layer. And the reason why um, next Saturday, Charlotte, one of my colleagues is going to uh, be providing the program on compost. She's gonna dive really deep into these concepts, really uh, getting in the nooks and crannies of how awesome compost is, how to make it and why it's so beneficial for um, reducing pest problems around your garden. So I'm just gonna touch on it a little bit. So why compost? Compost improves your soil structure, that's why. Uh, compost also increases the health of the soil. It also increases the diversity of microbiology, which is what we want. We really want healthy soil that's loaded with a diversity of microbiology. And compost does that. Compost also increases the health of the plant because it's making the nutrients in that soil more readily available for uptake on the root systems of those plants. And then it also increases the water holding capacity, which is so important, especially here in California when our summers get quite dry. The importance of working with organic fertilizers. So organic fertilizers, I really can't say enough about it, but they are the most sustainable way to feed your plants. What we're doing is we're feeding the soil, we're feeding the microbiology, which then will uh, feed, have these beautiful symbiotic relationships with the root systems and allow for easy nutrient uptake and allow those plants to absorb the nutrients in a more natural way. The trick here is that um, to understand when we're working with synthetic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers are uh, typically those things that have really high numbers, the NPK is usually like 10, 10, 10 or 16, 16, 16. Or in the liquid version of those fertilizers, they turn green or blue when you add water to them. Understand that synthetic fertilizers are one, extremely high in salts. Salts are quite detrimental to the soil. But more importantly, that synthetic fertilizers act like steroids to the plants, really stimulating a lot of new growth. And when we have a lot of stimulated new growth, now don't get me wrong, that looks awesome for our color bowls and our hanging baskets because we want those to be in bloom the whole season. But at the end of that season, those plants are typically ending up in the green bin. And the reason why is because the, uh, the plant ha has given all that it can. But the other thing I'm getting at is that when we have a lot of stimulated new growth, guess who likes that new growth? Guess who likes those tender, succulent, sugary new leaves? But the insects. So when we have a lot of these growth spurts, we're going to invite a lot of insects to come and feed off the sugars of that, those new tender leaves. When we're working with organic fertilizers, we have a tendency to not have so many of those growth spurts, to have uh, uh, less pest problems that we're inviting. So I'd just like to uh, ask you to keep that in mind. Please work with organic fertilizers whenever possible. Then we're going to take advantage of the amazing components that mulch has to offer. Now, uh, when I'm talking about mulch for this program, I'm specifically talking about something that's a, a natural organic material such as wood chips or straw. And when we lay a nice layer of mulch on top of our soil, ideally anywhere from two to four inches, we are going to uh, reap the rewards of how incredible that mulch is. It reduces uh, water evaporation rate significantly. It protects the soil from heat and cold. It feeds the soil as the uh, chips or as that mulch decomposes, it's actually adding food to the soil. And it creates habitat for our beneficial insects. But here's the thing. We wanna have a nice thick layer of mulch on the soil. We, we do not wanna have that nice thick layer around the crown of our plants. The crown of the plant is the area where the top part of the plant 
meets the root system. So the stems and the root system meet, that's called the crown. We always want that area of the plant to be clear of leaf debris, to be clear of soil built up or mulch built up. So it's always nice to kind of go and pull the mulch away from the crown and you can actually feel that mat of roots, that's ideal. But then we really want the mulch to be between the plants, on the soil, protecting the soil. Not always easy to achieve four inches in an established garden, but moving forward, I always plant my plants just ever so slightly high, not this high, but more like that high, so that I can uh, allow to have a nice mulch layer across the soil between the plants. Here is a photo from the Orchard People. If any of you are familiar with it, you know how awesome her website is and the great work that they do and their really cool podcasts that they have. Uh, this is what I'd like to share is that when it, during the winter months with our uh, perennials, our fruit trees, our shrubs, anything like that, but our roses, but more importantly, our roses and our fruit trees, because they really like to get a lot of food year round. What I like to do is I will put around the drip line, see how what she's created is that straw is around the drip line of the tree, layer of fertilizer, yummy organic fruit tree fertilizer for this fruit tree, then a layer of compost, then the layer of mulch. You see she's using straw as mulch. That's gonna be wonderful for the winter season. And as it rains, that rain comes in and helps incorporate all those nutrients and the microbiology will come up and also incorporate those nutrients. So here we're gonna have our first pause and I did receive a couple of questions before and I'm just going to address those really quick. So someone has asked, when is the best time to fertilize a camellia and a Daphne? So the, um, I'm going to start with the camellia. So there's a number of different species of camellias. More, most common is the Sisanquas and the Japonicas. They have different blooming seasons. So the first question I would ask is what variety is it? However, beyond even asking that question, my rule of thumb is the best time to fertilize anything that's flowering is right after the flowering period. So the Sisanquas probably started blooming as early as maybe October, and they could be just now finishing their blooms. So I might go and um, maybe in February, after all the blooms are done and I've cleaned up all those petals because I, I don't want to encourage petal blight, and I am about to put a nice mulch layer over the root zone, I'm going to then fertilize, put a nice layer of mulch over that uh, fertilizer and the root zone. I'm gonna slightly scratch the fertilizer in, put the mulch on top, and then we're gonna be good. Uh, I know some people that will fertilize their camellias again in the summertime, doing a similar practice, scratch the fertilizer in, put the mulch on top, and then they should be good for that next blooming season. So rule of thumb is fertilize after a blooming season. With the Daphnes, I'm gonna say that Daphnes don't require uh, a lot of fertilizer. They're actually quite sensitive. So you want to um, just get a very nice balanced organic fertilizer, uh, maybe a nice all purpose or flowering fertilizer would be fine. and we, don't, we can do it again after the blooming season, but you don't wanna to go too heavy handed. Jen, were there any questions that came up that we can answer? Yeah, first of all, I wanna say a lot of people didn't get the outline and that is probably on me and I'm really sorry. We're putting it on the blog right now um, so you can all access it. Um, there's gonna be a couple bumps in the road just starting out this program. So this, this is one of them, okay, but we're getting it on the blog. Um, and then there are some really good questions. Um, one is I have problems with gophers in my vegetable garden. I have tried pellets and sonar devices, but nothing has worked. Do you have any suggestions? Gophers, um, so we, 
we'll talk about this a little bit towards the third section when we really talk about tools, but the best way to manage gophers is going to be with traps. So um, I encourage you to check out the UCIPM website. You can even check out my website. I wrote a nice article about managing gophers. But a uh, quick question is persistence. It, uh, they are very, very smart. Um, they do get wise to us very quickly. And so being patient and persistent with our efforts. There are repellents on the market that you can get that are castor oil uh, based. The active ingredient is, is castor oil. This is not toxic uh, for our pets. This is not toxic for our plants. It is going to strictly be a repellent that is very effective repelling gophers and moles and voles uh, in the garden areas. Now, sometimes these products do need to be reapplied. You wanna follow the uh, application instructions that are on the label and you should have success with that. Um, Jen, I had one more question that I want to address if that's okay. Uh, there was a question that came in that was, um, there's a shady area in the garden that happens to have white specks on the dirt. And the question is, is this a harmless fung fung fungus? And I just like to say one, it's hard to say if it's a fungus or if, is it perlite bits or something that were, was in the soil, but let's just say if it's not um, another uh, material like little perlite bits, let's say it is a fungus, uh, it's highly unlikely to be harmful. There's only a couple kind of uh, uh, fungal problems in the Bay Area that would be reason to be concerned, which is the Armillaria, Armillaria um, Malaya, which is the oak root fungus, or the Phytophthora, uh, which is the Remorum, which is the sun oak death. So, um, all uh, the way fungus works in the garden or with their relationship with plants is we're going to see uh, mycelium or fungus webbing around the soil. It's easy when there's like a, a log or a compost pile that we've like moved over and we see a lot of white webbing. That's going to be the mycelium of or the hyphae of the you know, the, almost the webbing of the mushroom, the fungus. And the mushrooms that we see are the fruiting parts of that fungus. And oftentimes if we see this and we, and we, we have it related to the plants, because if we see it next to um, an oak, then we might want to look a little bit more and see, is this a harmful fungus? But if it's just in a shady area of the garden, we might want to look at, um, increasing some you know drainage making sure things aren't getting staying too wet for too dry or just acknowledging that it's a natural part of the garden and I wouldn't worry too much about it so kind of a cumbersome answer to that question but thanks for asking it there's a lot more questions so let me know um we'll take maybe three two or three more for yeah let's let's take maybe one or two more and then let's okay. keep going all I can right. assure everyone we're going to be here for a good solid uh, uh, all the way to, yeah, the 1130 hour, if not to noon. So hopefully everyone's prepared for that because this is a good solid program. Everyone's excited to start gardening. So yay, I know me too. Um, okay. I'm hoping you will touch on how to get rid of an infestation of white flies. They're everywhere in my front and backyards. This has been a big problem for a few years. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to talk about that actually in the next section because when I see white flies, um, that's usually an indicator of overwatering. So that's the first thing I'd like you to look at. So it, are you overwatering in that area? And that's not always an easy question to answer. So you might think you're not, but I'd invite you to take a closer look. Um, the other thing is, is now we're looking at the irrigation and you're going to adjust that and make it uh, better, more suited for your plants. Um, we're going to notice that the white fly nymphs are on the underside of the leaves. So we're going to use products like insecticidal soap. We're going to follow the, instruct the instructions on the label. The application rate is going to be to reapply about once every five to seven days. We're going to do that. We're going to uh, apply it a couple of times. We're also going to put yellow sticky cards out because the adult white fly is attracted to yellow. So this is really the one and only time that I'm like um, 
encouraging two things, uh, working with insecticidal soap and the yellow sticky traps. With that, you should be able to um, have some nice management. Okay, one more quick one is, do you, uh, best times of year or day to fertilize or times to avoid? The best time of year to fertilize is, well, kind of depends on the plant. So if it's a flowering uh, perennial or shrub or um, then after the flowering period, uh, this is a great time of year to fertilize fruit trees. Um, citrus are heavy feeders. They really like to be fertilized year round. So you're fertilizing citrus like every month to every other month. Um, vegetable gardens, if it's annual vegetables, I'm fertilizing at time of planting, but then I'm also fertilizing with liquid fertilizer. I'm watering it in through the growing season. Perennial vegetables, I'm going to treat the same way I treat my perennial flowers, my ornamentals. Um, and that maybe answered the gamut of all the plant worlds. And what was the other question? Was it just fertilizing? Oh, when not to do it. So when we don't want to fertilize is the same time we don't want to work the soil or plant in the soil. We don't want to work any soil that's too wet. So uh, we just got rains. Prior to a couple of weeks ago, we were having a very dry season. So right now is not the time that I want to dig into my soil because I want to protect it until it dries out a little bit more. I can put things on top of it. I don't want to walk in those areas too much, but I can put things on top such as dusting fertilizer, manure, or compost, and then mulch on top. But I don't want to be working the soil when it's too wet. Okay, one more or should we keep going? Uh, that's up to you. Um, Let's keep going because there might be some more. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, so we wanna take advantage of the rainy season to add plants. So really the fall and winter are the best times to plant. However, as I just mentioned, if the soil is wet, we're gonna wait till that soil dries out. But the reason why this is the best time of year to add plants is because we are going to take advantage of the coming rains to water those plants or help water those plants we are in the cool time of our year. We have lower, uh, shorter daylight hours. And with that means the root systems really have a lot of time between now and the summer, before the heat of the summer, between those, before those stresses of the heat of the summer really are um, on. So right now is the time to give those plants all of these months to become established for those root systems to grow and develop and to um, really root in before uh, the heat of the summer. And that's why this is the best time of year to plant. What plants are best for my garden? Here in California, we're gonna choose California natives or Mediterranean native plants because they adapt really well to our climate. We're going to match plants to the conditions of our garden and keep them from, which will keep them from being stressed out or susceptible to pests. Remember, stressed plants are going to be more prone to pest problems. So that's why we want to plant plants according to the environment and the microclimates. We want to choose plants that are the pest and disease-free varieties. There's so many on the market nowadays. So check those out. Other things to consider when we're adding plants is we wanna consider what the garden's microclimate needs are. What are the conditions of my garden? And we want to plant plants that are, uh, will work according to that microclimate. Uh, how much space do we have? If we only have a, a space that's about three feet by three feet, when we go to the garden center or we do our research, we're going to notice these tags at the garden center. These tags give us a lot of information. They tell us about the sun exposure, uh, but they, they tell us more importantly, the size that the plant is going to get. So if I've got um, a space at three feet and I go to the garden center and I see a beautiful plant that I've just fallen in love with, but I see that it's going to get to four feet, that's not going to be any good because what's going to happen is we're going to struggle to keep that plant in the size and shape of the space. We're going to be pruning it a lot, which means we're going to be encouraging a lot of new growth, which means we're going to be encouraging a lot of pests. 
So when we can uh, find plants that fit in the space that we have, then it's going to be a much better situation for us and the plants. Uh, we want to understand what the topography of the garden area is and work with that. And then we also want to ask ourselves, how do we intend to use this space? Uh, do we have children in the house that we want to make a, a child's garden? Do we want to make a, a butterfly or pollinator garden? Do we have pets? So we need to have, you know, if we've got puppies running around, maybe we need to have plants that are a little bit more sturdy, that are less likely to get uh, broken if they're like pouncing through. Or do we want to grow more food. These are all things to consider when we're making a plan. Plants for the Bay Area Gardens. So these are just some plant lists that I came up with that I really love. I have a lot of fun referencing these plant lists and I like to share them with others. So if you're not familiar with the Arboretum All-Stars, check that out. It's really fun. It's a great, great resource. Also Basqua, the Bay Area Water uh, Supply and Conservation Agency, they have an amazing uh, catalog of plants that grow really well in the Bay Area that are going to be water wise and very adaptable. Uh, of course, the California Native Plant Society has an amazing resource of plants, our local master gardeners, and then go to your, check out your local garden centers like Slope. People ask all the time, what plants are best for my garden or what can I plant right now? Well, here's the thing. You go to your garden center right now, they're going to have plants that you can plant right now. So a couple things, uh, this question came in, what can they, uh, what can I plant in my patio, uh, my containers on my patio right now? Well, first things that come to mind are our pansies, our viola, cyclamen, and our primroses. And I have to say the species primroses are my most favorite. It's a lot of fun. And this is going to be our fall color to get through the season. So hopefully you find that helpful and uh, inspiring to check out. When we plant, we want to group plants with similar needs together. So that's hydrozoning it with plant selection. So grouping plants with similar irrigation needs, also similar sun needs, wind needs, shade needs, and heat needs. So just keep that in mind. because when we're planting plants with uh, similar needs together, then they're going to thrive together with a lot of ease. Irrigation. So as I mentioned a moment ago, we were having a very, very dry uh, fall and it was starting to look like a very dry winter until just really this week or two weeks, we've just started to get rains. So up until this point, I had not turned my irrigation system off. So something I just like to invite you to understand is that when we're talking about irrigation and watering and um, having these controllers, we want to be a little flexible. Uh, these are not set it and forget it systems by any means. We are constantly, and constantly I mean about at least in the minimum every three months, like quarterly, or about every month, maybe every other month, we're going out and we're adjusting the clock because we want to adjust the amount of water that is getting uh, distributed around our garden. When we work with drip irrigation, understand it is the most effective way to uh, water our plants because it uh, keeps the water very localized and it allows the water to, uh, allows us to really water our plants deeply. Makes direct contact with the soil so there's less water evaporation. Uh, these irrigation controllers, uh, help us so that we can set the time for the irrigation to uh, water our plants early in the morning when the air and the soil are cool. So for me, I see the best time to water is anywhere from that like kind of 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. period. However, you know, as early as maybe four in the morning, uh, but really not much later than 8 a.m. We really want to make sure that we're watering early in the morning so the plants uh, really or the soil can really absorb that water throughout the day. Uh, we can set our clock for multiple start times when we have these irrigation controllers, which is really helpful when we have a steep slope because we want to avoid having that water pool and kind of run off. And with that, irrigation timers really help us prevent overwatering or runoff. 
If you're not sure when to water or how or when to change your watering schedule, you can look up, uh, visit your local water district website for watering schedules and water conservation ideas. So um, just keep that in mind. But when we water, we really want to water deeply. Okay, so understand roots are only going to go where the water goes. So when we water shallowly, we're going to have shallow roots. Okay, when we have shallow roots and we have a hot day, that water evaporates very quickly. And before that water schedule comes back on again, that plant could be undergoing some stress. So over time, these little bit of stresses can add up. When we're watering deeply, we're allowing those root systems, we're driving them deeply. We are uh, then allowing uh, the, the root systems to not be under stress if we were to have some type of uh, excessive heat or if the irrigation were to break. Those root systems will be so established, they'll be able to still access some of these deeper water areas uh, or moisture that is in the soil. So the best rule of thumb is to understand we want to water deeply and less frequently. Now, when we buy the plants, the plants are usually in these little containers like this. So this is the size of the root zone. Then as those plants, so when we planted it first, we're going to focus our water needs around the root zone. But as that plant grows over time, we're going to encourage the roots to go out and down, out and down. This illustration on the left doesn't really show roots going out, it's just really down, but we're really encouraging both. This is an aerial illustration that kind of speaks to this. So though this is a tree, this could be a perennial, you know, a shrub, a rose. Uh, but so what we see is that the root systems really expand out around the drip line of that plant. And this is where we're going to focus the water and we're going to focus any fertilizing. We do not want to focus the water at the crown, you know, or fertilizer at the crown. Remember, uh, it's not going to do much good because directly under the crown, the root system is rather thick and is not able to really access or uh, take up any water or nutrients. We really wanna keep it out of the fibrous little root hairs. Those are the ones that are taking up the nutrients and the moisture. Hopefully that makes sense. And because I'm a huge advocate for keeping water on site, I just wanna remind everyone when the rains come, it's a great opportunity to harvest rainwater. So um, a lot of us live in areas where the uh, agencies or local water districts offer rebates. So check out rebates because there's some good ones out there. But whenever possible, we want to keep water on site. Uh, we are a lot of us are familiar with the 50 gallon rain barrel. That's the picture on the right. This is at my house. Uh, that's awesome but I wanna share one inch of rainwater over a thousand square foot surface like the roof of your house equals 625 gallons of water that we could capture. So 50 gallons is great, but whenever possible, there's all these incredible new urban uh, water catchment system, these cisterns that you can find at places like the Urban Farmer. Urban Farmer has a lot of locations around the Bay Area or farming supply or irrigation supply, check it out. These are uh, shapes are now made to fit alongside of houses to uh, be like low profile and stuff. Check it out, they're awesome. The great way to water your vegetable starts, potted plants, things like that. These are not systems intended to hook into your irrigation Would we, where you'd be doing regular watering. This is really supplementary water where I'd be using my watering can or some type of watering bucket. Okay. Yes, there's another pause for questions. And why Jen gets started on that, I have a couple of questions that I'm going to address. Uh, one person asked about uh, trimming vines. So she has a Thumbergia that's new. She's asking, uh, can she cut it back really hard? Uh, well, my um, it really kind of depends. We have to know the plants, right? So some perennial vines we can cut back really, really hard and they spring back out no problem. Others are a little woodier that we might just want to trim them back. So 
In this case, I always encourage trimming. Uh, trimming encourages new vigor and it get, brings a lot of new growth and makes things look really, really nice. Uh, so yes, go through and trim. Just kind of tip off all those tips, reshape it, uh, cut off any areas that are undesirable or reweave it through the fence or the trellis. Um, and pinch it back would definitely be a, like a hard pinch back uh, would really do that vine some good. With roses, I know that there's a class coming up about rose uh, pruning, but with a climbing rose, what I encourage is that we have the main structure of that rose. So it might be a, a number of canes that we've we've uh, developed in a shape that we want, perhaps fanned out. But from those canes, we're going to have all the little sub branches that come up. We always want to prune those back according to rose pruning practices to encourage more growth. Um, and that was, should answer the rose climbing rose question. But like I said, there's a rose pruning workshop coming up. Uh, I think just in a few weeks, Jen will let you know, or you guys could check it out on the Slope website. What other questions have we got, Jen? Okay, we have a bunch. And also I wanna say that I just, the outline is up on our blog and I've sent everybody who emailed me a copy. So again, sorry about that. Thanks, Jen. You're awesome. Um, all right, this is a good question. I have several peach trees that showed peach leaf curl this last season and did not produce any fruit. I have tan bark throughout the yard. Would it be best to remove the tan bark from the trees and put a circle marked by stones and then do the layering as you suggested? We're gonna talk about um, peach leaf curl in the next section. We're gonna dive really deep, but... Um, with peach leaf curl, you want to remove any leaves that have fallen. So when we've got bark underneath or mulch underneath those trees, those leaves fall oftentimes and can kind of get caught between the, you know, the layers of the mulch, not always easy to see or rake up. So yes, around the drip line or around the circumference of that tree, you might want to remove that mulch but putting rock down is not necessary. Um, you will, I, it, let's say if it's an apple tree or a peach tree that doesn't have any significant disease, I would always rake or pull back the mulch, put the fertilizer down, put some compost down and then put a nice layer of mulch back on top. Um, peach leaf curl is a problem that is Peaches, we live on the coast in California. They peach leaf curl, that fungus thrives on cool, wet springs or cool, wet conditions. And our springs have a tendency to be really cool and wet. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So peach leaf curl is kind of challenging, but bolstering the health of the plant, uh, fruiting and peach leaf curl are not always um, related. I mean, if the... Peach leaf curl can inhibit fruit production, but if your tree isn't healthy, you know, you really want to make sure we're watering properly, we're feeding properly, and that it's in the best location, you know, and that it's not planted too deep. You know, there's a lot of things that we can look at. So it could be a, a couple of problems that are um, making one problem look worse. Um. Another follow-up question on mulch, and I think it's important that you're talking about it because it can really um, help the garden or affect the garden. If you have used wood chip mulch the previous year and it has not decomposed, should you lift it before doing the layers of fertilizer, compost, and more mulch, or just leave it and do a new finishing layer of mulch this year? You can always put more mulch on top of more mulch. So that if you've got last year's mulch and you just want to add more mulch, just put it on top. But if you have, you know, plant material that you want to fertilize, you're going to want to pull that mulch back, add the fertilizer and then reapply that mulch. And it could be old mulch or new mulch. Um, Something I want to point out, because there was another question that I forgot to address when we're talking about soils. So someone asked, what is the best soil to use when they're um, transplanting plants in pots? 
And so one, if you are um, upsizing, you know, from one size pot to a larger pot, or if we're just planting in pots for the first time, we always want to use potting soil. Potting soil ha is designed for pots, has the word right in there, potting soil for pots. Planting mix, soil amendment, these are for the garden. These are going to be for raised beds. There's even raised bed mix, planting mix, garden mix. These are all going to be for larger areas of the garden. So uh, focus potting soil for pots. Anything else, Jen? Okay, yeah, no, we have a ton. Um, considering our California climate is December too early for winter feeding roses, they tend to keep growing, not reaching full dormancy. Good question. So this is, uh, someone else asked a question about rose slugs and this, so rose slug uh, person, I hope you're out there, listen up. We in, especially in San Francisco, uh, some of the other areas of the Bay Area do get colder, so they have a tendency to go into full dormancy more so than especially like uh, the tighter East Bay and San Francisco because it stays warmer. Sometimes we have to actually strip the roses of the leaves uh, because there's just not enough chill in the air for them to really go into full, full dormancy. So that's really important. We wanna strip those leaves. The reason why, and get those leaves off site because those leaves could very well have black spot or rust, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but they also could be harboring eggs. Specifically, the rose slug will lay their eggs in that midrib of the leaf. And if we don't strip those leaves off, then those eggs are just hanging out there and they're like waiting for the weather to get warmer so they can get their party started. So it's really, really good just to strip those leaves. And your roses could still be blooming, but guess what? You got to prune them. So, uh, Fruit tree pruning, I normally do around now. Uh, usually it's those couple weekends after the new year, I'll get out and prune my fruit trees. These are dormant trees, not citrus or evergreens. And then roses, I'm usually going to do uh, about the beginning of February. And so, I mean, that's just how I do it. Doesn't mean everyone has to follow that exact calendar, but uh, we really want to make sure we're pruning our roses, even though they seem like they haven't gone into dormancy. Um, this is a really important distinction. The difference between compost and mulch, people are wondering because they're hearing you talk about both of it. So oh. I know. Yeah, so compost is decomposing matter. So you might start off with uh, like lettuce or you might start off with um, clippings from your um, perennials deadheading your perennials, things like that. And you've had them in that, like a bucket. And then maybe we put it in a green bin that goes off to the municipal compost, or maybe we have a composting system. And in that composting system, be it a thermal compost, passive compost, a worm bin, vermiculture, it goes from something that's recognizable to something that looks very much like soil. That's compost. Mulch is going to be what I'm referring to as mulch is an organic natural material like wood chips or straw, where I'm laying that on top of the soil as a protective blanket. Now, compost, you can certainly put compost on top of the, your soil as a protective blanket. You can use compost as a mulch. However, mulch is something that's going to be chunky, that's coming from like tree or straw, you know, like bark, like chips or straw, whereas compost is always compost. It looks like soil, it smells like the earth, like the forest floor. Um, Hopefully have that's couple... helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with your descriptions. <laughs> Um, a couple of questions about planting high or planting deep. Um, and if, if there's a plant that's been planted too deep, can you dig it up and replant it higher? Yeah, good question. And because what happens is, so I, 
over all my years of working in gardens for clients, there's a lot of different types of soils out there. So it's hard to kind of show on the screen. I'm gonna to try to gauge it so the bottom of my screen might be the top of the soil, let me see. So I don't, it's not a really identifiable, like dramatic way I plant, but it's always slightly high. And the reason why is because when I've amended the soil, I've also added a lot of air. It's all fluffy and nice. And over time, that soil is going to settle. And then the plant is going to settle slightly, hopefully slightly above grade, just the ever so slightly above grade. But what happens is sometimes if you don't gauge it right, right and the soil is really soft, it can kind of sometimes sink. We really want to be mindful when it sinks because then that's an opportunity for soil and mulch to and leaf debris, plant material to build up and kind of get around that crown. If you can, um, if it's not that established or you know if it's newly planted or if it's small enough, we can actually lift that plant up, get some soil underneath it and raise it up a little bit. Uh, not always possible, like if it's an established fruit tree that maybe has been in the ground for you know a decade before you even got to the property and then you discover that it had actually settled about four or six inches. Well, there's no way you can lift up that plant. So you're just going to have to dig almost like a well around it and be really mindful that uh, you know every you know month or so you're just removing anything that's kind of settled in that area. Hopefully that's helpful. Um I have mushrooms that grow in my shaded garden in the winter. Should I remove them or are they beneficial to the soil? I would have to say for the most part, yeah, mushrooms, the whole world of mycelium and, um, and, and the whole world of mushroom culture is extremely beneficial. They have this symbiotic, symbiotic relationships with plants. Mushrooms are the fruiting part or the, uh, uh, of this mycelium, of this webbing. If you are worried about the mushrooms, um, some people are a little bit more sensitive to them or they have like maybe a pet that isn't as smart and will have a tendency to chew on them, then yeah, let's just pick them up and put them in the green can or get them off site or you know, put them in your compost or something. That's if we know that's not um, like a, a pathogen, like um, something that is going to spread. We wanna just get those mushrooms off site if we're not familiar with what they are. But if they're, um, I've got mushrooms, a lot of different varieties of mushrooms all around my property, and I just kind of let them be. Um, I think they're fun. It means it's raining and that there's moisture in the soil and that life is happening um, and they don't bother me so much, but it's really, uh, you know, a personal preference. But for the most part, um, you know, you can decide to remove those and get them off site or just let them be. Don't try eating them unless you know. What they are. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, this is a good question. Do fertilizer do fertilizers have a shelf life? Maxi, for instance. Also, do you prefer pellet or liquid fertilizers? Um, fertilizers have a shelf life. Um, it's best to use fertilizers when they're fresh. Organic fertilizers are natural um, uh, components, you know, like, uh, alfalfa meal, cottonseed meal, uh, sometimes fish meal, things like that. That's what the ingredients on organic fertilizer, we're always going to be able to read the ingredients and we know what they are. Do they go stale? Uh, the, um, the, um, how do I say this? they could, let's just say they could go stale. So it's just important to use the fertilizers when we have them. And I'm saying like maybe within a couple, like maybe a year or two of purchasing it. So I don't have a very large area. I'll just, I have a tendency to always buy just the boxes or, you know, the smaller size, like a four or five pound size of fertilizer and use it as I need it. When I worked for clients, of course, I always got like the, you know, 10, pound bags because I was using fertilizer a lot. 
you kind of want to consider to use your fertilizer, I'd say within a year is best, but let's say you found a bag of alfalfa meal that was in the back of the shed. That's like maybe 10 years old. What do we do with it? Well, let's just use it. Let's just get it into the soil because in the least it's something else that is going to um, be, you know, that can get incorporated and get decomposed into the soil. Something like maxi is, um, okay. Well, synthetic fertilizers, um, again, those things that are like little beads or um, that turn blue or green when you add water to it, they are going to be synthetic. They're going to have a different type of shelf life. They should pretty much stay uh, um, relevant for years to come. The thing that kind of wrecks them is moisture. So sometimes what happens is if there's a lot of moisture in the air, those little pellets or beads kind of get globbed together. So then you'll have to like break it up with a trowel or in the case of maxi, when there's sometimes moisture will get in the container and it turns into kind of more of a, uh, like crusty glob, but still you can add water to it. It's going to break down. Um, I just want to say one thing, maxi is not organic. So it is a synthetic nitrogen, um, urea, uh, but you know, maxi is really great. I personally use maxi on my orchids. That's kind of my gray area. It's the only non-organic fertilizer I use, but I just like to put the shout out that it is not organic. Um, what do I prefer granular over liquid? When I'm planting plants, I'm going to use a dry fertilizer, the stuff that looks like meal, you know? When I have uh, plants that are growing in containers or throughout the growing season of my annual vegetables, I'm going to add liquid fertilizer. If it's something that needs a lot of fertilizer that I know thrives on fertilizer, such as my citrus, my roses, I'll do dry fertilizer seasonally and then liquid fertilizer through the growing season. All right. Well, Jen, let's keep moving and then okay. we can get more of these awesome questions in a minute. So um, I think that I've answered everything so far too. Okay, cool. So now let's talk about maintenance around the garden. So if we haven't already, this is the time of year to clean up the garden. We want to deadhead and cut back perennials. We want to remove anything that's dead or damaged, those branches that are dead or damaged. And specifically, we want to move, remove anything that might break in a big windstorm or some type of a weather event. Because uh, if we have branches that are um, hanging, that are kind of heavy and are maybe vulnerable to break in a weather event, we just want to trim them back a little bit to get the weight off of them. Because what we don't want is we don't want a limb to break. It could be uh, detrimental or cause some harm to that plant. Also, we want to be mindful of um, structural damage. So if we've got any limbs over a tree or um, limbs over a roof or a house or a shed or a garage or a fence, let's trim those, okay? Uh, we can do this before, let's say if it's fruit trees and we typically don't do our fruit trees uh, pruning until like now or in a couple weeks, but last month we saw a couple limbs that were questionable. Yeah, do some, uh, just, preliminary, just kind of rough pruning before you dive into your fine pruning. Just let's just make sure things we want to secure the safety of our plants and also our properties. And we want to remove any diseased leaves and get them off site. We don't want them hanging out over the winter because those diseases are also going to be present. We want to really focus on sanitation. We want to remove any of those uh, fruits that are still on our fruit trees at this time, such as these apples, uh, or, you know, if there happen to be any plums that are left over from the summer or anything that's on the tree that is just not ripe, is overly ripe, is rotting, we want to get that off the tree. Uh, we want to remove these. Uh, we also want to remove anything that's fallen because what this is is just a vector. It's an invitation for critters to come. It's an invitation for the rats, for the yellow jackets. And it's also an invitation for insects and other diseases to overwinter. So uh, fungal spores can spread. These are the diseases that can spread when um, these leaves or these fruits are hanging around. So we want to also remove those. So just sanitation is really key. 
when the rains come, so do the weeds. So we want to get on top of that, stay ahead of the weeds, because when those weeds are knee high, that's no bueno. We want to make sure we're kind of managing the weeds when they're little, because that's when they're easy to take care of. When they are start to get taller than about four inches, uh, when we're up at that six inch range and above, that's when weeds are really harder to manage. It's because their root systems have really developed. So when one of my best, well, no one really likes the answer I have. People ask me all the time, what's the best way to manage weeds? Hand pooling. But, you know, not a lot of us have the time or energy to hand pull weeds. So that's why there's so many amazing weeding tools. And my most favorite weeding tool is sheet mulching. Sheet mulching is the practice of laying multiple layers of cardboard overlapped. So the edges overlap. So we have this mat of cardboard, cardboard like a carpet of cardboard. And then we're applying no less than four inches of mulch on top of that. Now, it could be a combination between compost and mulch. We can have two inches of compost, two inches of mulch, but really what we want is no less than four inches of mulch on top of that compost. Keeps the weeds down. You don't even have to mow or cut or anything. Just put the cardboard on top of those weeds. They're just going to magically go away. And then of course, a whole assortment of weeding tools like the hori hori, the trowels, weeding hose, cultivators, dandelion weeders, line trimmers and mowers. There is a whole assortment of ways to manage weeds, which is uh, fairly effective and easy. Fruit tree pruning, we've mentioned it a couple times. I know that there is a program that Sloat is going to be offering coming up very soon about uh, fruit tree and rose pruning, so stay tuned for that. But this is the time of year to prune. Now, I've already addressed a couple of the questions about pruning, uh, but just understand that a lot of us, especially fruit tree uh, uh, deciduous fruit tree owners, deciduous fruit trees are the fruit trees that lose their leaves in the winter. We have a tendency to not want to prune our fruit trees, especially when they're little. We want to let them grow and then we're going to prune them, but that's not how it works. We are going to always be pruning because the tree is continually going to grow, but we want to be pruning because pruning fruit trees helps with fruit production and helps with overall health of the tree. Okay. Everyone, the moment you've been waiting for, we're going to talk about peach leaf curl, we're going to talk about dormant sprays, and we're going to talk about what this all is. So first of all, what are dormant sprays? So this is a term that's been used in the horticulture industry for decades. Um, I'd like to say sometimes it's considered like an old fashioned term, but what dormant sprays refer to are uh, pesticides that we use during the, the dormant season. And what that means is trees, fruit trees and shrubs, such as roses. So fruit trees like our pears or apples or peaches, our plums, they all lose their leaves. They go into a dormant cycle. Roses lose their leaves, leaves go into a dormant cycle. And, um, it's our opportunity to apply a pesticide at a stronger, more concentrated rate so that we're not burning the leaves and we're able to prevent diseases and in insects. So horticulture oil is traditionally used uh, as a dormant pesticide and that is to kill the bugs. Horticulture oil is used to kill overwintering eggs, larvae of the insects. Copper fungicides used as a dormant spray are used to kill the diseases. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now, reading the label. Now, this is kind of tricky. A number of reasons is because there's a lot of words on these labels, it gets a little overwhelming and the font is so tiny, but it's very, very important. Because as I mentioned before, we have to know what the pest is. The pest is not on the label, that pesticide is not going to work for that pest. So here, we're gonna go back to the peaches, that those pictures at the beginning of the program with the peach leaf curl and the aphids. So I've identified the bonide horticulture oil for insects. I've identified peaches on my label. 
I see aphid eggs, great. And now what is the mixing rate? Now this is kind of funny. It says dormant and delayed dormant. First of all, what does that mean? Dormant means right now our trees are dormant. There's no leaves on it. Delayed dormant means right before the buds crack and we get these beautiful flowers, we start to see some growth. We see buds swell, those nodes start to swell. We start to see them almost push a little bit right before they crack, that's called delayed dormancy. The minute those buds crack and we see petal color, dormant season's over. So we are going to apply, it says use 2.5 to 7.5 tablespoons of oil per gallon. This range is kind of tricky. The 2.5 means growing season because we can use horticultural oil for aphids year round, but we are going to mix it at a growing season or a diluted mixing rate. For dormant season slash delayed dormant season, we're using a stronger, more concentrated mixing rate, which is the 7.5 tablespoons. So over here, peach leaf curl, we're using a fungicide to combat the leaf curl on peaches and nectarines. The mixing rate is four to six teaspoons. We're going to apply this as a dormant or delayed dormant, so before bud break. And then um, it's gonna be four to six teaspoons. We're gonna go with that six teaspoons per gallon of water because it said that on the page before. And then we're gonna note. So the label tells us a lot of information, okay? So we really wanna take the time. And what I like to offer is that we take these little books that are on back of the pesticide bottles and we save them because if they stay on that pesticide bottle, they're gonna kind of get wrecked or take notes in another way. Then we have our sprayers. So when we mix concentrated pesticides, if we noticed, I'm gonna go back, these are all for, uh, you know, like 7.5 tablespoons per gallon, six teaspoons per gallon. For sake of easy math, I'm going to say four tablespoons per gallon. Okay, that's not on these labels, but I'm going to use that because it's a lot easier to use uh, math equations with the number four. So just because it said, hypothetically, four tablespoons per gallon, I've got my tank sprayer. I go and I buy my one gallon tank sprayer. I'm all excited. I'm filling up my one gallon because it says to mix a gallon, but I go out there and I have my one fruit tree and I spray it. And I'm like, whoa, I've got a lot of pesticide left. What do I do? Well, guess what? We have to use what we mix. These are concentrated pesticides. They, are, they don't have preservatives or these uh, uh, stabilizing agents in them. So that's one reason why they're less expensive to buy, but it's really important to understand how much product we need to use when we go out there to spray our trees. So if the first time you've ever used this, uh, a, a pesticide on your tree, when we have no idea how much to make, well, let's just get our, our tank sprayer, fill it up with water. So I filled it up with a gallon of water, I'm out there, and just spraying water on my tree. Water is, you know, is easy. Now I can see how much did I use? Oh, I only used a quart. Okay, bam, magic. Now I know I only need to use a quart or mix a quart of pesticide. So when I go back and I get one tablespoon of the pesticide, I mix it with a quart of water I mix it up really well. And then I go and spray my tree. And then I make those notes on the outside of this tank sprayer with my Sharpie, you know, peach tree, one quart of copper fungicide. So um, I'm just gonna move this, sorry, love it. So that is going to be a really good tip for you to help you gauge how much product to use because again, we have to use what we've mixed. If we only have a little bit left in the tank, just keep spraying the tree or the rose or whatever it is until we've used it all up. We don't get to pour this down the drain. We don't get to pour it out into um, any vulnerable areas. And we don't get to store it in the tank sprayer because it's going to lose its uh, vitality pretty quick. Pesticides break down rather quickly when we've um, 
mixed them up. We, they're really intended to use pretty much straight away. So hopefully that is helpful. I know it gets a little complicated, but hopefully I've been able to explain it well. Okay, so we get to have another pause for questions. And there's only one more section of the program. So let's maybe just take two questions. Okay, um, a lot of people are saying this is a ton of really good info and are really liking your program. So I just wanna- Oh, thank you guys. Out. Thanks everyone. I wish I could see all of your beautiful faces, but I really appreciate that feedback. It's nice to hear, thank you. I'm glad it is a lot of information. So thanks for uh, keeping up with it. Uh, okay, question. I've heard that using copper isn't good because it contaminates the fruit with pesticide or chemicals and the fruit should not be eaten. Okay, so copper. When we use it as a dormant spray, we're using, okay, this is the other cool thing about, okay, so I didn't really go into the why working with dormant sprays are so awesome. The reason why working with dormant sprays are so beneficial is we are using a more concentrated version of that pesticide. So we're able to really hit that uh, fungus, that disease, or that pest. We're able to coat it really well with the product, with the fungicide or the insecticide. And we're now uh, able to reduce that pest. We're in theory using less product because there's less surface area on the plant, there's no leaves. Um, I will do my dormant spray after I've pruned my fruit trees. That's why now, although with peach leaf curl, we're, we want to spray three times through the winter. So I would have sprayed around Thanksgiving, around New Year's, and then again around Valentine's Day. So we have less surface area, we're using less product. Yes, we're using it more concentrated, but we're in theory using less product. And if we are using it appropriately, we're focusing the product on the plant and it's not, there will be some um, uh, runoff to the soil, but we're not applying so much to impact or cause any type of copper toxicity to the soil. As far as the fruit, I have not read any data or heard anything from my organic peach tree, nectar green tree growers. What I will say is that my organic grower friends will use a foliar spray of liquid seaweed through the growing season because even if we do a spray of copper through the dormant season, because peach leaf curl is so uh, prone here in California because we have cold wet springs, even though we did spray um, a preventative, there is a chance we can still get peach leaf curl in the spring. And so nipping off those little leaves new leaves are gonna grow, doing a foliar spray of liquid seaweed because seaweed is a cell growth stimulator. It's gonna stimulate the growth of healthy cells. This is what's going to also promote the health of the tree, which now we're going back to bolstering the health of the tree so that those plants can kind of withstand these moments of stress from having the pest problem. Does that answer your question about copper toxicity and fruit of that tree? No, but these copper products are registered under state of California for use, organic use for peach production. Now, it's up to you if you want to um, follow that and um, trust that that is clean enough. Um, I'm certainly not an advocate or no judgment. I have my own um, ethics around pesticides, even eco-friendly pesticides, but that is um, what I know. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah, and also reducing the 
that you can cut the leaves to the most infected leaves. Doesn't that help? Yeah, we're removing those leaves, new green, and we're getting them off site and new leaves are going to grow. If peach leaf curl is going to, those leaves are going to drop to the ground. And if we leave them on the ground and more rains come, then those spores are going to splash back up into the plant. Um, so to that point, somebody asked, does it help to spray the ground too around the plant or? Yeah, that's a good question. No, it's really helpful to just remove infected uh, uh, leaves, get them off site. That's why it's not always easy to see when they fall in and we have mulch. So with that earlier question, yeah, remove that mulch around that area and put it in another area of the garden or get it off site. Uh, maybe, you know, um, yeah, maybe just get it off site. If you know your fruit tree, your peach tree was heavily infested with peach leaf curl, um, maybe that area of the garden, um, your putting down maybe, um, I don't know, some type of barrier to capture those leaves. I'm thinking like maybe even row cover because water will still penetrate the row cover if we get rains, but then maybe you can capture the leaves or some type of a fine mesh netting to capture the leaves. So it's not getting into the mulch. Um, I don't know, we can get clever. Um, uh, do you want more questions or do you want to do the last? Let's keep going and then we could spend a lot of time just in to respect everybody else's time because there's just a wee bit more and then we can certainly dive into questions for gosh as long as we want right because this is the fun part. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so now let's talk about other tools that we use to prevent pest problems. Now this of course is for inside the house. Uh, we're going to, you know, use weather stripping. Not only does weather stripping keep heat um, in and cold air out, it also keeps bugs out, flying insects and crawling insects. Remarkable, very inexpensive way to keep bugs out of your house. Fresh bead of caulk around windows, cracks and crevices, gaps of cabinets, um, floorboards, things like that. Another incredible inexpensive way to keep bugs out. Screen. This screen like everyone to note, this is quarter inch hardware cloth. Screen, when it's galvanized at the hardware store, it's called hardware cloth, no idea why. And I'll tell you, if you go to the hardware store and ask an associate, where's your hardware cloth? I will bet you they're gonna look at you like you've got three heads because they don't even know this is called hardware cloth. Wire meshing, fencing material, it's usually what I ask for but this is called hardware cloth, it's galvanized. This is quarter inch. That means the mesh size is a quarter inch. What's so important about this, rodents can't squeeze through it. Rats and mice can fit through half inch, but they can't fit through quarter inch. So this is an attic vent and we have quarter inch hardware cloth placed securely behind it to prevent rodents from coming in. So keep that in mind when we talk about some other exclusion means in the garden in a minute. Other barriers, we work with row cover, we work with bird netting, we work with gopher baskets, deer fencing, copper tape barriers. How can we exclude and prevent pests, regardless of what their shape, size, season is? How can we prevent them from accessing our plants, our fruit, things like that? Exclusion frames, fencing, and baskets. This is big, 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 big because we happen to have rats as the number one pest problem in our gardens these days. So um, for those of you that can relate, listen up. We are growing more food in our gardens, so we happen to have more rodents in our gardens. I know it's yucky to talk about rats in the gardens, but it's the truth. So when we're trying to exclude rats and mice, we're going to work with hardware cloth, quarter inch, so that smaller mesh size. So we can make frames, like the second picture from the left, it's awesome. Big Fun Gardens created that, they're in San Francisco, check them out. Um, this is a frame that actually is kind of mobile, it lifts the side, lifts up, it's all um, hinged. Or, you know, if we're trying to keep gophers from eating root systems of plants, for all of you that have the gopher questions, make sure everything is planted in a gopher basket. And a gopher basket is going to be made out of quarter inch, I'm sorry, half inch hardware cloth or 
proper gopher wire or a basket that's already pre-made. Um, squirrels, preventing squirrels, like this squirrel baffle that is put over this beautiful pot of uh, violas on the left. We're going to work with quarter inch fencing or poultry wire or something similar to prevent the squirrels from getting in. And sometimes just laying the a wire on top of the surface of the soil. We can cut it. We can just lay it on top. The squirrels will not dig. Raccoons will not dig. Cats will not dig. So for all these other problem pests that are a little bit more difficult to manage because they're freely roaming around. If they're digging in the soil, doing unfavorable things, digging up our plants, pooping, things like that, let's just put a layer of poultry wire on top. Bam, solve the problem. Deer fencing. Deer fencing needs to be seven feet tall or the deer can just jump right over it. So these are just things to keep in mind. Traps. Traps have a lot of different shapes and sizes. We've got the yellow sticky traps that help with the white flies and the aphids. Blue sticky traps help with thrips. Uh, gopher traps, other rodent traps, okay? Snail and slug traps, slug board. How many of you have used a slug board or even knew about a slug board? It's awesome, super easy to make. Boom, put it out there. Slugs and snails go there when the sun comes up because they don't like the sun. They, you know, they want to stay cool in the shade. Lift up that slug board, scrape all those gross slugs and snails into a bucket of soapy water. Bam, just got them. Okay. Fly traps, yellow jacket traps. Trick with the yellow jacket traps, we want to put them out in March when those queens are starting to emerge because for every queen you've captured, Thousands of yellow jackets you just prevented from um, taking over your property. So let's just use these traps, super easy. We're not using any pesticides. We wanna grow healthy garden habitat. We do this by planting a variety of trees, shrubs, and perennials. We offer a water source for our pollinators and our um, birds, even during the winter. So as I mentioned, we've had a very, very dry winter or you know, fall, I've had my bird bath filled and I also have small little glazed uh, saucers that I put pebbles in for the pollinators. So they can come and land on the pebble and access the water without drowning. Of course, I'm refreshing this water regularly to prevent mosquitoes. We do in the fall wanna let some flowers go to seed such as the Japanese anemones because the birds use this as nesting material. Uh, we use chunky mulch, that chunky bark mulch uh, is really great because it, uh, it provides shelter for many of our beneficial insects. But then keep in mind that there's always an area of the garden that we want to leave kind of natural and uncultivated foreground nesting pollinators. We want to invite the birds. Birds are amazing at being our great friend and managing pests. 90% of birds at some point in their life eat bugs, including hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will feed their young little tiny micro insects. So invite the birds, welcome the birds. Um, they're going to do a lot of good for you. And then bring in the beneficials. Let's invite the beneficials. I'll be doing a program about this coming up soon. I think next month it's on the schedule. So stay tuned, join me. We're going to learn a lot about who the beneficials are, how to invite them, who they're eating and why they're so fantastic. But understand that, uh, like I said earlier, most of the bugs we see in the garden are actually beneficial insects. We just don't recognize them. And then we think they're the bad guys eating our plants and then we try to annihilate them. So let's uh, invite them because they're going to help manage the bad pests as well as pollinate our flowers. We're going to choose plants that attract beneficial insects by adding uh, a, a diversity of flowering things, but more importantly, a diversity of things that have small flowers, such as this daisy at the top. Those white petals are actually raised. The flowers are actually that yellow button in the middle. It's hundreds of little tiny flowers, similar to the yarrow on the bottom. That yarrow might be one cluster of flowers that we see, but it's actually hundreds of little micro flowers within the flower within the flower, which is crazy. The reason why we want a variety of flowering plants that are small is because a lot of our beneficial insects are tiny and they take advantage of the nectar that these small flowers offer. And then when we use pesticides, keep in mind, we use as a last resort, 
We always use eco-friendly or less toxic ones. We apply according to the labels instructions. We always use our PEE. We want to wear uh, PPE to protect ourselves because even though it is less toxic or organic or whatever you want to call it, eco-friendly, these are all pesticides designed to kill something. And yes, we can have a dermal reaction from using neem or insecticidal soap. So please make sure that we are wearing long sleeves. We are wearing uh, pants. We are wearing shoes. We are not out there in our short shorts and our flip-flops spraying the roses, okay? I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then we want to take advantage of the dormant season because we're actually getting the most bang for a buck when we can. Things to keep in mind is that less toxic products sometimes take longer to work. So there's a couple questions about neem out there saying it didn't work for them. Well, guess what? It does work, but it doesn't work in the same way that maybe insecticidal soap works because it doesn't necessarily kill the insect immediately. It could take about a week before that insect dies. During that time, that insect is still feeding off the plant, okay? Timing is important. We want to know the life cycle of that pest and apply the pest during that time. So there was a question about Buddleia budworm. If that budworm isn't present, that we can spray BT all we want, which is very narrow range, very eco-friendly, very low in the toxins. But if we're spraying and that budworm isn't present, that budworm isn't the budworm needs to ingest that pesticide. So we're kind of wasting time and money. So we want to make sure the pest is present so we can, the, the pesticide can do what it needs to do to knock that pest back. Okay. We also want to apply pesticides at the end of the day, after those four o'clock winds, when the sun is going down, because especially in the summer, our pollinators, they're still out there working hard. I've seen our bees out there still harvesting at sundown. So we want to make sure we are applying these after uh, pollinators are in their hives, they are at rest and not in the area. Again, even though these are eco-friendlies and a lot of these eco-friendly products uh, advertise themselves as bee safe, they are bee safe once they are dry. So when we spray them at night, they have the entire evening to dry. And by morning, pollinators can come back out and, uh, you know, work those flowers and not be impacted. If we are releasing beneficial insects, then give the beneficial insects some time before we apply the pesticides. And again, we are going to use pesticides when we are not... Uh, there's no forecast of rain or frost within 24 hours, and there's no breeze more than five miles an hour. And that goes for the dormant sprays as well. So when we've got products at home, even eco-friendlies, and we just don't, they're old, or we just don't want to use them any longer, what do we do? We take them to our local household hazardous waste facility. It's free, it's easy, it's there to help us out. And then in close, because you guys are all still here with me, this is awesome. Anyone who thinks gardening begins in the spring and ends in the fall is missing the best part of the year because for gardening begins in January with the dream. Here we are, it's January. Mm. Need a sip of water. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Boy, we just learned a lot. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your awesome questions, for joining us. It's just been a treat and a pleasure. You can reach me. I'm Suzanne Bontempo at Plant Harmony. I have a little blog that comes out. Please, a lot of your questions that you've already asked, I've already addressed and I'll continue to address them. Um, you can email me. Um, please join my newsletter. It doesn't come out that often. Join Sloat's newsletter. It's awesome. There's so much great information and look at both of our websites for upcoming programs. I will continue to answer your questions here because I know there's quite a few more. And um, yeah, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Those are other great places to see what we're doing. Um, it's just really fun to connect. So thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. This has been super awesome. I've learned a lot myself too. And I know a lot of people <laughs> It's been good for uh, beginning gardeners too. So I think you kind of covered the range, which is really great. Um, 
and there are a ton of questions and there are still a bunch of people with us so i mean we can Yay. take another 10 minutes or so and answer some more um i did want to recognize that i do see uh questions coming through on my email i can e i can forward those to suzanne um for you and so she'll see those too so it, i'm not ignoring you i i see them there's just a lot of questions so um i'll do that after the show the program um okay so one question is can i use dormant spray on my citrus trees oh wow great question thank you for asking that no dormant spray is for plants that go through a true dormant period and what true dormancy means they've dropped their leaves um and they're not growing citrus it is an evergreen fruit tree that grows year round. So um, no, you cannot use your dormant spray on a citrus. Um, when should you prune a lemon tree or should you just cut away parts as you gather the lemons? Citrus, it's a tricky one because here in the Bay Area, the greater Bay Area, we have citrus leaf miner and citrus leaf miner is attracted to the new growth. And when we prune our citrus too often, there, or you know, too frequently throughout the year, we're gonna stimulate new growth because that's what happens. But if we stimulate that new growth too early in the season, we're gonna attract more citrus leaf miner. So the best time to prune citrus is at the end of the summer where there's enough time for that new growth to harden off before a frost comes. Um, you can prune when you are harvesting your fruit, but be careful that you're not, I mean, I've got flower buds starting and fruit that isn't even ripe yet on my lemon. So the timing's kind of funny with citrus. So I'm going to give you this information and, um, just invite you to use your best judgment. Um, coddling moth traps. Do they work on mature apple trees? Yeah, they sure do. Coddling moth traps uh, and as well as other sticky traps are typically used as monitoring devices, not necessarily as controls. So with that said, calling moth traps do an amazing job at capturing adult calling moths as well as helping us identify when the thresholds are so much that then we need to take action. That action can be spraying a product with spinosad, which is the active ingredient, Captain Jack's or Monterey's garden insect spray. I know there's other products out there with spinosad in it. Um, or you can buy a product online. I'm not sure who sells it in the greater Bay area, more of a farming supply like Harmony Farms or Peaceful Valley Farms. That's a product called Synx. CYN-X, it's a biopesticide, it's beneficial bacteria that you can spray on your trees and um, you can spray it as many times as often as you want. And um, it's excellent at managing coddling moth. The reason why I mentioned that is because spinosad on the label says you only get to spray six times in a year. Though it is a, um, it's a fermented bacteria, it's very low on the toxins. However, there is a limit to how many times we can spray because we see pesticide resistance uh, occur with this product. So very important to limit the sprays to six times and be very strategic with that spray. But if that is something that you foresee not being able to happen uh, as an option, then you wanna work with this other product that's a little bit more expensive, but um, very effective. Okay, a few questions about roses. Um, what's the best dormant spray? What dormant spray do you recommend for roses to help with black spot rust and rust? So black spot and rust is a disease. So we're going to use a fungicide. So we're gonna go back to that copper. Um, there was a question that I got um, about rose slugs and thrips. So rose slugs are going to, when we're talking about dormant sprays um, or when we're talking about pesticides, we really wanna understand what the pest is in the life cycle. And this isn't always easy, it's a little tricky. 
So with the diseases, um, we're going to remove any leaves that have the diseases on it. And then we're going to spray that copper fungicide. If it's the insects, we're going to remove those leaves. Cause as I mentioned, the eggs can be in the leaves and we're going to spray with the oil. There are some pests like thrips that they are going to be hibernating in the soil. So they're not even on the plant. So with that in mind, once the soil temperatures start to warm, we are going to apply um, and inoculate the soils with beneficial nematodes because the beneficial nematodes are going to feed off of those thrips larvae that are overwintering in the soil and break that life cycle. Um, okay. There's such a range of questions. I'm trying to figure out the, the most commonly asked. Um, again, a ton of people really enjoyed your presentation. So thank you that I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's really fun. Awesome. It's really been fun. Um, fire blight, you want to touch on that oh. at all? So fire blight again is another disease that affects plants in the rose family. So um, commonly seen on pears, that's where I see it. I see it, uh, gosh, it's very common on pear trees and it's really contagious. So if you're pruning that pear tree with your pruning shears and you have that, um, that uh, bacteria, I believe it's a bacteria, could be a fungus. So pardon me, I sometimes have to look it up. Um, on your shears and you make a cut somewhere else, you've just passed it on. That's um, when pollinators go from like pyracantha, pyracantha normally gets it too. They can actually transfer it with the pollen. So um, that's why it's so, it, it's kind of a challenging one. But when we have fire blight, we wanna cut it. I believe I'll reference the UCIPM website and I believe it says to cut um, a foot past the infected area. Typically when you cut, you can see there's a little darkness inside the uh, stem. If there's still darkness, I'll go even deeper. Like I'll cut even further down. And then I wanna make sure I've sterilized my um, tree saw, uh, my pruning saw or my uh, pruning shears with uh, rubbing alcohol. So, and straight rubbing alcohol. I always have those uh, antiseptic wipes with me that I get at the drugstore when I'm working for clients. Or if I'm at home, I've got a spray bottle of uh, rubbing alcohol that I just spray on my um, tools. And that typically, and then of course you wanna get that uh, diseased wood off site. And that typically takes care of it until the you know, pollinators or you know, something comes around and infects the tree a little bit more. And then with that said, you can remove that plant and plant something that's resistant or something that's a different variety that isn't gonna be so prone to the fire blight. Um. Uh, just a note, everybody's asking about the recording. We are going to post it on um, our blog. So that should be done in the next like, day or so. This is all sort of, we're sort of figuring out the technology and everything. And so um, it, hopefully it'll get smoother along the line and you'll all have your outlines before the class. Um, and and then the people that still have outlines, um, feel free to email me Jen Strobel at slopegardens.com and I'll send you the link for that. Yeah. Um, and anyone, if you just email me, we can, I can get that to you as well. So either of us, you're in good hands. You'll get everything that uh, we promised you. I wanted to say a side note to Grace who emailed us earlier about the rose slug and about neem and thrips. I'm going to dive into those questions more um, in my blog. So if, I think I have a post already about thrips if you wanna go have a look at it, but um, it's more, thrips are a little bit more complicated. So um, I just invite you, if you don't mind checking that out. And then the rose slug was such a great question. Um, I wanna dive a little bit more into rose slug other than what I've already shared. So if you'd like more information on that, um, a lo longer answer to your question, go check out my website. Yeah, uh, a few uh, questions on thrips. So that's good to know that they can uh, 
go on over there to your website. Um, also, spider mites. A few questions on the on spider mites and okay. what, what's your best. Mm -hmm. So similar to um, okay, spider mites are typically an indicator that um, there's not a lot that the plant is under stress and that there's not a lot of good air circulation. And so I typically see spider mites. It's not uncommon if it's the front entry of a house or some type of an alcove where I've got a uh, beautiful potted plants, but it's there. They can take the shade or they can take the light, you know, exposure, but typically there's not enough air circulation and they kind of get dusty and stuff. You see the cobwebbies kind of behind those potted plants that are like in the alcove of the front door. That's usually where I see spider mites. So uh, of course, spider mites are going to go in other places, but that's a good example that there's not good air circulation. So when I've got spider mites, oh, also I can share, you know, what really uh, stimulate spider mites. I usually always ask what liquid fertilizer are you using? Because if it's a synthetic fertilizer, that's usually also kind of goes hand in hand, um, sadly. So what I'll do is I'll open up, uh, I'll just prune some of the branches or the leaves, you know, I'll just kind of thin it out a little bit. So there's more air circulation. I blast it with water. Um, just to kind of hose off the plant. And then I make sure that, uh, was it planted too deeply? Am I irrigating it properly? Is it staying too wet or is it staying too dry? Am I fertilizing it too much with the synthetic fertilizer? You know, these are, this is kind of the checklist I go down. Has it outgrown its pot? You know, even though we're trimming the sides of the roots, we're doing a root trim and, you know, putting fresh soil. Sometimes that plant just really doesn't want to be in that small of a pot. So uh, these are all things to check out. Um, yeah, that's just the first, that's how I start. And then if I need to use a pesticide, um, I'll work with horticulture oil or, um, you know, um, what's my other go-to? Well, you know, I really like working with um, the pyrethrin, which is a natural chrysanthemum pesticide. It's a natural pyrethroid. Pyrethroids are highly toxic, but pyrethrins are not because they break down so quickly. Um, little to no impact on the environment, but it's a very strong pesticide. And um, sometimes, especially, we'll see it mixed with sulfur, which makes it uh, um, also have some fung fungicide properties too. That's a really nice pesticide to use for harder to combat pests like spider mites. Takedown, takedown is pyrethrins with um, canola oil. You, do you want a couple more questions? Or yeah, you, you sure. Okay. Um, somebody's posted this a couple times and I guess I didn't see it, but the... Fruit trees, how long do they typically, what is the lifespan of a fruit tree? And um, hers seems to be disease prone after 20 years. And so she's just wondering if that's kind of normal or if, if she should replace them. Well, my question would be, what is the fruit tree? But uh, fruit trees can live a long time. Like my auntie had an apple tree that she finally just got rid of when it was like 45 years old. It was just starting to kind of like decline. So after 20 years, yeah, we could see tree decline. Um, the fact that it's getting diseases regularly doesn't necessarily mean that it's the tree itself is at an age that it would be more prone necessarily. What happens is, is that, especially in an urban environment, if we have, uh, if the tree uh, doesn't have enough space to expand, it could be under stress. And with that, it could be more prone to the disease. So uh, sometimes when we have pest problems, it is an indicator of a stress. That's why we go back to fertilizing and watering practices. Um, but if again, this is a tree that is a constant problem that we're having to use a pesticide every year to manage and the fruit production has declined and it just now has ended up being kind of a burden, give yourself permission to remove it, get rid of it. It's kind of an expensive job to remove an established root tree if we have to, you know, get rid of the root system, you know, uh, 
grind out the stump, but then we are liberated and we could, you know, put something else up. Um, uh, a, a couple of people just as a side note, a couple of people said that future classes, the were close for, were closed registration. They're now open. We, we just, we went through it with this first class where we didn't anticipate the um, enthusiasm. So yeah, it's been so awesome. It's, you guys a, are so fantastic. It's a great problem to have. I'm so excited. Everybody's su super excited about this. So we uh, upgraded the package so we can have a bunch more people attend. So all of the classes going on should be open. Um, you know, right now they're up open up to 500 people. We can add the next package if we need to. So feel free to sign up. Um, and then again, the recording will be available on our blog and I think Suzanne will have a copy of it too. Um, and then a couple of people are concerned with using the yellow sticky traps. Uh, will they, will bees be attracted to it? And, you know, yeah. So great question. Thank you for even thinking of, um, about our precious pollinators. Sadly, uh, yes, um, we will have some beneficial insects get stuck to those cards, um, that's why we want to look at thresholds. We want to do everything we can before we have to uh, go to that um, means. So we're bolstering the health of the plants. We're monitoring our irrigation. We're monitoring our fertilizing. We're making sure that the root systems of the plants are healthy and happy. The crown is healthy and happy. The plants are planted in the right place so that they can thrive for their conditions in our conditions. Um, but things happen. I remember a couple years ago, the um, diabroticas, the little uh, cucumber beetles were really coming on strong. It was a good year for them. And I, my thresholds, it was hit. So I put out the, you know, cucumber beetle pheromone sticky traps. Did I get a lot of um, cucumber beetles? Heck yeah. They were like covered within like 48 hours, just gobs of them, crazy. Did I get some pollinators? Yes, I had, I think the total of about three. So the ratio, did it make me feel good? No, but then I was like, but I was able to really kind of not but knock back this, you know, excessive population of cucumber beetles. So we have to always kind of understand that there is a um, threshold of what is of, of, of our action and understand that again, um, if we're using eco-friendly pesticides or we're using these types of uh, sticky traps or any type of trap, we wanna be as mindful as possible to only target the pest. Even putting an outdoor ant bait station outside, making sure we've covered it with some type of uh, basket so that only ants can access it and not critters or having the ant bait station in the house making sure it's up on the uh, away from access from our children or our pets or you know um, making sure that we're putting um, the gopher trap in the gopher hole deep enough that a cat or dog can't come over or a fox can't come over and access it so we really are being mindful that when we're taking these actions we want to only target the pest the best we can. And yes, do we make mistakes sometimes? Sadly, yes. And that's why we learn from those mistakes and we keep moving forward and sharing our stories and talking about it and seeing how we can do it better. So long answer to the sticky trap question, yes. But if we've done everything else and we still have these problems, then we have some choices, remove the plant, or put the sticky traps out because maybe it just happens to be a significant year and you know plant a lot of flowers for the pollinators because then you'll be able to support those communities even though you've accidentally killed one or two. Um, I'm growing a lemon tree in, in a pot. Do I not want to use mulch since there's not a lot of space from the crown? Oh, great question. 
I uh, always mulch my containers. And uh, I also like to plant with my lemon trees, uh, with any of my, um, anything that I can grow really well in a container, container that is like a perennial vegetable or like a fruit tree. I love planting alyssum and thyme at the base because they also are gonna attract beneficial insects. But for mulch, heck yeah, you can put mulch around the pot. Um, you just wanna make sure there's a couple inches that is clear from the crown and you really can feel that mat of soil. Uh, just make sure that's clear and then put the mulch over here. Yep, you could do a great job with mulch. Uh, when do you prune blueberries? Blueberries, I think you're probably pruning them about now. And the fruit tree, I bet that your instructor for the fruit tree class, Jen, will talk about blueberries. But yeah. that book that I had referenced, um, Pruning the Fruit Trees, which is on the resource page, they also discuss blueberries. But um, I think you're pruning them now. I like to prune my blueberries right when they start to push new growth. So I can kind of see what is um, growing and what isn't growing. I do the same thing with Japanese maples and I do a similar thing with the roses. I kind of wait a little bit before uh, they all break dormancy so that I can kind of see where the new growth is. Um, okay, let's do one more. Uh, what is the difference between a copper and a sulfur spray? Uh, well, they're two different chemicals. Uh, they're two different um, um, components. Uh, one is, um, wait, what is the word I'm trying to use? Uh, they're uh, the metals. They're two different things, two different organisms. So they're both going to work as uh, fungicides in the horticulture industry, uh, but they work slightly different. How different are they? It's a very advanced question that I'll have to research. <laughs> um, but read the label and just yeah. You know. Wow, that's I love. It. I got a stumper. Um, I know. I mean, we're going to use them differently because what isn't it? Grapes that are phytotoxic to sulfur. Um, sulfur also can burn when things are too hot. Um, there are some things that, yeah, you it's not advised to spray sulfur on, but then, um, so copper might be a better choice, but copper is kind of traditionally used as a dormant spray, but the copper soap fungicide, that was this big scientific breakthrough. The copper soap is now something that is readily available and is commonly used during the growing season. That was the Bonides uh, copper soap fungicide. Also, I think Monterey produces it. A couple people do. So um, that's kind of newer revolutionary science. So. Well, I mean, this has been super awesome, Suzanne. I can't thank you enough. And I mean, so many people really enjoyed your presentation. So I'm looking forward to uh, future classes with you and we'll have them posted on our website. Um, and we'll also, if you're on our Facebook or Instagram, we also post um, about, I think a week in advance or five days in advance, two of the class. So you can follow along there. Um, visit Suzanne's website. She's full of information. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Everybody go out and be in their gardens today. It's a really nice day Yay. in the Bay. Thank so. you everyone so much for joining. It's such a treat. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for having me. Thank you everyone. And hey, keep up the great work and have fun. Just have fun out there. Enjoy your gardens. Thank you. All right, stay safe. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Thank Have you. a great day. You too. Oh, wait, hold on.